All right, our next speaker is uh, Daniel Gribben. He's a member of the American uh, Aeronautical Society. He's a life member. He's exhibited, he's given talks at the stamp shows on uh, French South Atlantic flight covers. And he's written many, many articles on uh, the, the French side of the South American uh, story. And like any good uh, marriage, we're going to hear how the French in their 256 flights were superb to the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel. No, Tim and I are good friends. So, uh, <laughs> this won't be a cat fight. Um, can you out here, Jack? I appreciate that uh, so many avid collectors and uh, aviation enthusiasts come out early this morning. Uh, it's wonderful to have such a good audience and it's wonderful to be in this place. Let me give you an overview to begin. On September 1st, 1939, the German invasion of Poland effectively ended this remarkable period of, um, I'm going to call it three years, during which the Two European airlines cooperated to offer twice weekly transatlantic mail service between Europe and South America. Uh, as Jim said, Germany took the lead in 1934. Beginning in February, had bi-weekly service with weekly service following pretty close behind there. So the French effort to achieve that kind of consistency took considerably longer. Now, you can make all kinds of jokes about the difference between the German and the French temperaments, but um, it proved out in this case. So what I'd like to do is uh, describe that gradual process that the French did make uh, during the 1930s to establish weekly airmail service to South America. Also to discuss the obstacles that they were confronted with, some of them self-imposed, sadly, um, and uh, we, the story really begins in 1928 with uh, the inaugural service linking Paris and Buenos Aires. So that's the, that's the ground we're going to cover here today. The dazzling first step that the French took was uh, the first flight to carry official airmail across the South Atlantic, which uh, left Saint Louis which is close to Dakar, uh, on May 12, 1930. Um, Mermoz was flying uh, the Ladekoyer Van Week 28 that you see here. And as I was mentioning, you don't really appreciate the, the size of this plane. It's a single engine plane. But um, if you put a, a person on one of those pontoons, you realize this is a very large aircraft. Jean Mermoz had a crew of two, Dabri and Jeanier. They took 21 hours to traverse 3,200 kilometers from Saint Louis to Natal. Jim likes to talk about this as north-south. I like to talk about it as east-west. It's a little bit like I-4 in Florida. Uh, it's, it goes north-south, but it's measured east-west. So anyway. East West. Um, the mailbags were offloaded at Natal and loaded onto uh, Lattaquare Vance Sank of Lattaquare 25, which was flown by Raymond Vanier. I mentioned that, you'll see why in a second. And he flew the mail then down the coast to Rio. And this is a, a registered cover canceled on the 10th in Paris, May 10th, addressed to Jeanier, the radio man. So I think they prepared uh, several of these souvenirs for the crew. What's interesting about it is that uh, it's addressed to Buenos Aires, but it's back stamped Natal. And it never went on to Buenos Aires, in my opinion. Uh, they gave them to the crew because that crew stayed there in Natal preparing for the flight back. So kind of an interesting item in that respect. Um, I checked, this is not Jeanier's own handwriting, so somebody in the office uh, prepared these. <coughs> this is the cover that, from that same flight that did go on to Buenos Aires. <coughs> and 
that one got back stamped with uh, the official cachet, which you see down in the corner there. And uh, the actual uh, arrival back stamp is May 13th, so this was this was some pretty quick mail, but I, I don't think there was a whole lot of mail except uh, mail prepared for the special flight, actually. Both these covers are signed by Vanier, but not at the time of the flight, probably, because it seems to be ballpoint pen. <laughs> Just, uh, I think ballpoint pen came in in about 1950 or something, so... I picture someone who had these covers going to their uh, aerophilatelic meeting in Toulouse and Vanier shows up to give a talk and they, you know, slid these to him in the sign. Nice to have a signature. So the first transatlantic mail flight is obviously a great coup for the French, coming at the beginning of the new decade and heralding a new era for flying the mail. Unfortunately, it would be 1936 before the French could stamp a cache on envelopes touting 100% weekly air service for transatlantic mail, six years later. And that's what that cache tells us. And even that was fudging a little bit in 1936. So the story of those intervening years is the story of tragedy, internal bickering, mismanagement, I'll mention three consequences of all of this. First, Didier Dora was fired. He was the director of operations who, who really made this thing work, uh, and especially in South America, helped them to meet their deadlines down there under very difficult flying conditions. He was fired in 1933, and uh, that made 1934 a very interesting year for them. Marcel boyer Lafont was the businessman who developed landing rights, routes, uh, negotiated with the governments and so on in South America. And uh, they pulled the rug out from under him in 1933. And then they lost two crews in 1936, including uh, Mermoz. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But you've got uh, three major setbacks there over the period between 1930 and 1936. Eventually, multi-engine land-based aircraft of the sort that Mermoz favored all along, of the sort that the Condor uh, represents, uh, would enable the French to achieve the goal of weekly service. They had wonderful service, uh, 37, 38, 39, and on into 1940. Um, the German occupation of France was in late June in 1940, and that ended. Uh, the, that history for the French of their air mass service to South America. I'd like to talk a little bit about Mermoz and the challenge of those earliest flights. Um, Mermoz was one of the most extraordinary pilots in aviation history. That 21 hour nonstop flight in the single engine plane went a long ways toward establishing his legend. It didn't hurt that he was the most handsome guy in the, in the aviation fleet, too. But consider this, the return flight from Natal to Dakar proceeded as follows. After three days and 35 fruitless attempts, beginning June 8th to get the float plane laden with fuel and mailbags to lift off the water, it would not. Mermoz gave up, and that mail was loaded onto the boat and, and taken across. So you will see this item at auction quite often. It was not flown on that flight. It's dated June 8th. It says that it's going by air to Europe. It was not. It took a nice little boat ride. And so that's a, that's a Paraguay dispatch prepared for that flight. There's no receiving backstamp for obvious reasons. Um, the, the boat that it took, these boats were called Aviso, A-V-I-S-O, by the way. Uh, special Navy vessels outfitted for mail duty. One month later, July 8th, 1930, 
53 times he ran that thing loaded with mail to try to get it off the water. On the 53rd attempt, the float plane did take off. So they headed for the African coast. Um, 14 hours into that flight, a, an oil leak developed. They just simply overtaxed the engine uh, in those takeoff attempts. He landed the plane in the open ocean next to, they had a, a series of support ships, and he landed next to one of those ships, 900 kilometers off the coast. Um, they successfully got the crew and the mail aboard the ship, and then they watched the plane, <laughs> which has got to be galling because they made special efforts to make sure that the pontoons were perfectly sealed so that this would not happen. That was a sad thing for the most of you looking at it, I'm sure. Um, there was no special attaché applied to that mail when it finally made the 900 kilometer boat trip and on up. But, It is possible to identify that mail because it came in on July 16th in Paris. And this is a, an example of that. So don't think that the Paraguay item was flown. This rather unobtrusive looking piece of mail coming in on the 16th almost made it across the Atlantic in 1930. I'd like to talk about these flights using uh, Labrousse's system of A indicates a flight from Europe to South America, R indicates the return flight. So this was one A and one R. And this is a remarkable little book uh, that LaBruce prepared. It's got the flight number and the entire crew, and then he has some notes at the bottom that talk about uh, how long, the, he is how long the flight took, but anything, any anomalies are listed down at the bottom there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's something you really have to have to watch here. This is the time of flight from Dakar to Natal, or Natal to Dakar, essentially. And, and those uh, departure cities vary to some extent. You get used to that, too. But that's a good point, also. Three years later, the French developed the Cousinet 70, the Cousinet 70, Arconciel. This is a three-engine, land-based aircraft. And when Mermoz took off with five, a crew of five, including the aircraft developer, Cousinet, great confidence in his own creation, as you can see, uh, it performed beautifully. They made that flight uh, in, uh, in good time, and this is a, a, a wonderful postcard with the, with the entire crew that they prepared. Uh, now you can see up in the corner there. And this was, a, this was a very successful flight. Unfortunately, dependable runways were in short supply in South America. So um, the flight was in January. Um, the Germans had already discovered in Bathurst that, that if you brought land planes down, they were going to have strange and unusual runways to try to use. And so that's the reason they were out on the ocean uh, launching. And uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, it was, it was a similar uh, difficult problem. They talk about termite mounds uh, in the middle of uh, dirt runways and so on. And then torrential rains would, would wipe these runways out. Um, so while Deutsche Lufthansa was solving the problem with uh, Dornier Val uh, on a rail, uh, the French were stuck with waiting for better conditions on a runway over in, in South America. Um, so it was still in 1933, pretty much uh, an experimental kind of thing. They had the planes, they didn't have the runways yet, and they're still running the, the mailboats. Here we go. 
which was good, but it was four days. It was four days to get across with the Aviso. Whereas Mayor Moses' inaugural flight in, the, in, in 1933 in the Ark on CL was 15 hours. So that was the direction they wanted to go. Um, so flight 2A, 15 hours. Wait several months, <laughs> flight 2R comes back. And what flight 2R did demonstrate, however, was that a multi-engine plane is a good thing to have when one of the engines goes bad, which it did. <laughs> they still made the flight in 17 hours. So uh, Mermos was adamant that that's the direction they needed to go, land-based multi-engine plane. He was not a great fan of flying boats. In 1934, well, the Deutsche Lufthansa was enjoying the advantage of the catapult system. Most of the mail carried by the French airline, which was by then called Air France, was still being ferried by ship. Le Bruce lists eight round trip transatlantic mail flights in 1934 for Air France. The Germans made 23 round trip crossings that, during that year by the uh, catapult planes and um, the the special West Pollen during your wild catapulting. Uh, and then there were probably a dozen drop grass epilude uh, mail carrying flights in 1934 too. So um, the Germans had set the bar fairly high. Um, of those eight flights, it's kind of interesting because three were completed by um, a new flying boat that the French had developed, the Lacroix Poisson. The 300. Um, three of those flights were by the Quad de Sud, as they called this, the first uh, Life Aware 300. And three were by the Arc en Ciel that uh, uh, Mermoz really liked, the land based plane. Then two were by the Valerio 5190 Santos Dumont which was a four-engine flying boat, as, as was the uh, Quad Sud here. Santos Dumont did not look like much. Three forward engines, one pusher, uh, an odd kind of central post, uh, but it was perfectly dependable. It was a heavy flying boat, but perfectly dependable. So uh, you had three distinct designs of aircraft. And you would think, that's great, because the French now could pick what worked best, uh, and uh, they, they really had themselves set up well. Instead, they frittered that advantage away completely. Boyou um, Lafont was thrown aside, the man who had developed all of those routes in South America and put his own fortune up uh, to do so. Uh, they just basically, closed him down and uh, nationalized several of the airlines, including Aeropostal, in 1933. This was October of 1933. And so when you see Via Air France on this envelope, this is basically the first time that Air France shows up in that purple box cache there. Cousinet, who had developed the Arc en Ciel, the three-engine successful flying boat, signed a contract to produce three more of those, and they re the government reneged on the contract, um, effectively wiping him out as an as a aircraft manufacturer. Blario, a name which should be familiar to you because Louis Blario flew the English Channel, La Manche, uh, and uh, was a celebrated aviator and had received high awards and so on. He's the one who developed the, the ugly duckling there, the, uh, the Santos Dumont flying boat. Um, they told him to go ahead and build three more of those. Louis borrowed five million dollars to set up his manufacturing operation and then they canceled that contract. Louis died of a heart attack in 1936, and it did cause and effect are uh, in play here. The winner in this sort of rigged game about which 
design would prevail was uh, Pierre Lattacouer, who had originally developed um, French Airlines, and um, his quadrisu then, the Lattacouer 300, was manufactured in three more examples, they, they called those 301s. Um, but two of those aircraft would be lost in 1936, and if you really study the, the list of flights, you find that when the Quadrasud flew, it would be idle then for a couple of months at a time. It must have been a maintenance nightmare, something about rebuilding the engines and so on. Um, so, and then two of them went down. Now, the first one in January 36, with uh, Ponce as the chief pilot, uh, it might have been a weather thing, but um, this was right when they had just issued that cachet for 100% weekly service, uh, and then they lost Ponce's plane, and then in December of that year, they lost Marmos as well. Um, he went down with Ponce. Alexandre Colineau was Mermoz's favorite mechanic. Um, they were testing to see how well they could get over the Andes from Santiago to Buenos Aires. And Mermoz was willing to try to get a little lift. And then they hit a downdraft and crashed in, in 29th. And uh, it was Colineau who found a way to get that engine running again, and Mermoz made this dramatic uh, three hops to then get an updraft and take him back. So uh, Polino and Mermoz survived uh, what should have killed them, and then he went down with Ponce's plane in 36. Um, what happened with Mermoz in December was that they, they flew for several hours and they found that uh, the, the Poit de Sud had a bad engine, flew back, there was oil everywhere in that one engine, they sopped it up so that it wouldn't bother the electricals, sent it back out with the idea that, well, if it goes bad, just feather that engine and go on with three. Exactly what they did. And as they were transmitting by radio to tell them that they just feathered the engine, there was a loud noise in the radio probably because the propeller had sheared off and just sheared the fuselage and, and uh, Mermoz and his crew were never found. So, uh, 36 should have been the triumphant year when they established their goal of weekly service, but it was their tragic year as it turned out. To go back to comparative figures then, we recall that in 34 the Germans had 23 successful uh, Catapult flights, the French eight successful round trip flights. In 35, French completed 21, but the Germans had gotten better at it and completed 39 that year. And this isn't even kind of the graphs up one. In 36, the French had 43 attempts, 41 uh, completed round trips. Lufthansa had about the same number, 40. And so, uh, we're at the point of, of virtual parity as far as uh, their effectiveness in flying the mail weekly or close to weekly. And uh, so it was really 37 before the French had, had achieved that. And uh, Jim threw me a curve there when he said the other day uh, by phone that uh, that agreement had been signed in 1935 between the two airlines because uh, the French were still kind of hustling to, to try to compete uh, in 36 and uh, finally sort of caught up in 37. So the, the cooperation did eventually exist, but it was a kind of one-sided thing until 1937, really. Um, but then you got this twice-weekly uh, service by the two airlines until September 1st, 1939, of course. Uh, when Germany ceased their flights. Uh, I have a piece here that was uh, that was mailed from Poland in August of 39, uh, and uh, 
when Wolfgang showed me this, I said, well, I'm Polish, so, uh, or Polish, so I'll, I'll get this. And then the more I studied it, the, the more I realized that this was uh, just, you know, it was reaching South America just before uh, the Blitzkrieg started on September 1st. So it turns out to be a kind of a significant piece because there was, this is a piece of business mail, well, there was no business as usual in Poland. Uh, after that month, it, it was over. Um, this is a piece from uh, Valparaiso in, in Chile, and uh, this was mailed to England. Most of you probably understand that nobody was backstamping mail in England, so they're driving crazy with, uh, with not knowing exactly what happened, but there is one good indication on here that this thing made it to England uh, there in 19, June of 1940, and that is that censor tape. Uh, so this was very close to the end of the French service. Um, we're about to run out of time, so I won't uh, continue with how the routes developed on each side of the, of the Atlantic. But I wanted to show you the Farman 2200 because this was the land plane, the four-engine land plane that ultimately was perfectly dependable as a workhorse for the French. And isn't it ironic that they put all their resources into the uh, Latakoueth 300 flying boat, which looked beautiful and failed them miserably. And this plane, which was based on a bomber design, uh, flew for the last two and a half years with, uh, with no problems whatsoever. Uh, and uh, Renault's had it right. Land-based planes were the, were the way of the future. I came into all of this loving seaplanes. I come out of it admitting to you that we have to love the farm in 22. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs>